Okay, welcome to the gas variables POGEL uh, work through here. Just like all the other POGELs, we're going to be starting with uh, the first several problems and going until we hit the key symbol and then stop. So what I want you to do is download the POGEL, start with 1 through 11. The first 11 problems you're going to try and answer with your group or if you're doing this at home on your own and then you'll pause the video, do those 11, come back and then watch the video for my commentary. Okay, so you should have watched the first section of the video, or sorry, you should have completed the first section of the POGEL up to number 11. If not, go back and do that now. And we're just gonna start with question one. In model one, what does a dot represent? So I'm looking at all these different flasks. There's a bunch of dots, the arrows are coming off of them. And one thing I'm noticing is that Let's look at experiment A, adding more gas. We look at A1, A2, and A3, three different flasks. They're all stopper. They all have a bunch of dots in them. And it says adding more gas, so that's a clue there. Uh, looks like as we go from left to right, A1, A2, A3, we get more dots. I'm assuming then those dots are molecules of gas. Okay. And let's make sure it doesn't say that somewhere. Volume in this model is recorded. Units are liters for molecules of gas. Yeah. The particles shown here are much larger. If you look at the bottom, the little note there, it's, it's talking about particles of gas. So uh, here a particle is going to represent a certain amount of, of molecules, so maybe moles of gas. So it might be more, more accurate to say moles of gas. Now, if you read the top part, the why at the very top of the page, that little paragraph, notice that there are four variables that we're going to be looking at. And they say pressure P, volume V, temperature T, and moles N. So I'm going to put here the letter that represents moles of gas is a lowercase n. All right, that's all I need there. Two, name two materials in containers in model one that could be made from that would assure that they are non-flexible. Non-flexible materials. These are things that... Uh, that don't change their shape very easily. For instance, uh, 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 the opposite of a balloon. <laughs> that's a, that's a non-example. Uh, balloons change their shape very easily if you put gas into them. So if we look at A1, A2, A3, they have added, whoever did this experiment, put more and more particles or moles of gas in, and the shape of the container did not change. Containers that do that, well, glass, is an obvious one that gets used a lot in chemistry. Uh, you could do a metal container and this would work. It wouldn't be clear, but like scuba tanks are metal containers that hold gas that are not flexible. You don't expect them to change their shape much. Uh, you could do this in like a Teflon container. Teflon is a, is, is a material that's not gonna bend very well. Uh, you could try to think of more. Wood is going to be slightly porous, probably not the best, but it, it might hold up. I don't think there are wood containers. I'll say glass, metal, Teflon, probably the most likely. Uh, three. In model one, which we're assuming is a glass container, the length of the arrows represents the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So long arrow, more kinetic energy. Which gas variable is most closely related to the length of the arrows in model one? So Model 1 has the two sections, right? It has the one where all the air, the experiment A, the arrows all look to be about the same length. So all of those molecules have about the same kinetic energy. So I'm going to go down and look under A1, A2, and A3 at the, the things that are being measured. And I notice that the volume is the same in every single case. I notice that the external pressure is the same in every single case. And I notice that the temperature is the same in every single case. But the internal pressure is changing. So those arrows are probably not internal pressure because the arrows are staying the same. All right, so I can eliminate that. If I go to experiment B, going from B1 to B2 to B3, the arrows get bigger. So now let's look and see what's changing from B1 to B2 to B3. Well, the volume is not, so they must not be volume arrows. The external pressure is not changing. It's all one, so that can't be external pressure. The internal pressure is changing, and the temperature is changing. So it must either be internal pressure or temperature, except if we go back to experiment A, we said it couldn't have been internal pressure. 
because in experiment A, the arrow stayed the same and the internal pressure changed. So it looks like the only possible candidate here is temperature. So I'm going to say that the length of the arrows, based on this observation here, must represent the temperature or the average temperature of these molecules. I'll put T, capital T, is what we're going to use to represent temperature. Good. Complete the following table. Right, let's make a table here. Making a table. Do, 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 do. Uh, so we've got look at this. Okay. We have experiment A in this column. We have experiment B in this column. We have an independent variable here. We have a dependent variable here and a controlled variable here. And I have to complete that. The independent variable should be the one that I directly alter, and the dependent variable should be the one that I measure and see if it changed as a result of what I altered. The controlled variables should not change. Those should be staying the same. So I'm actually going to start with the controlled variables to see what doesn't change. And I'm going to look at experiment A. I see volume, 111. Every single time we have the exact same volume, so I'm going to say volume is a control. I also see temperature, 200, 200, 200. I'm going to say that temperature was controlled the entire time. And then it also looks like the external pressure did not change, so the pressure external was controlled all the way through. All right. So there's only two things left to put in, the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent is the thing that I did, that I was going to alter every time and make different so that I could measure some outcome. And if I look right next to where it says experiment A, it says adding more gas. So more gas, well I said that was particles, right? As I go from A1 to A2 to A3, I added more particles. That's something the experimenter did. He added more particles, or she added more particles. So and particles was n for number of moles. So I'm going to say n was the independent variable, the one controlled by the experimenter or altered by the experimenter. The dependent variable is the thing we measured to see what changed. Well, look at what changed down below. The internal pressure went up. So I'm going to say the pressure internal was what I was measuring to see if it had an effect. Cool. For part B, I can do some of the same things. Looks like volume is also constant in part B, and so is pressure external in part B. Uh, and if you, there, this is not listed down below, but you can look at each picture. Notice there are four particles in each picture. So the other thing that does not change is the number of moles. We kept as, the exact same amount of gas particles in every single experiment. So now I just have to see what did I change and what did I measure. Well, experiment B says heating the gas. So it must be that in each case I heated the gas to a different temperature. So what I changed was the temperature, or what the experimenter changed was the temperature. What did I measure to see uh, what was the effect of heating? Looks like the only other thing changing here is internal pressure. So that I'm checking to see if the internal pressure goes up. So, that should be number four. Now let's look at number five. Of the variables that were controlled in experiment A and experiment B, model one, one requires a non-flexible container. Name this variable and explain why a non-flexible container is necessary. So of the variables that were controlled, all right, so let's look at experiment A and experiment B. So here's number five. These are the controlled variables here. These are the ones I didn't change. Okay, and it's saying that one of those variables, in order to control it, in order to, in order, in order to keep it from changing, I had to have a non-flexible container. Well, a non-flexible container is one that doesn't change its shape or its size, and size is associated with, uh, we, in, in 3D, three-dimensional space, we call that a volume. A volume is a three-dimensional size. So if if I want to keep the same volume in each case, look at those containers, they have to be non-flexible. You can imagine, what if we did this with a balloon? A balloon is a flexible container. Well, then when I start adding more particles, you've done this before, I, I imagine, you've blown into a balloon, you added more particles. It didn't stay the same volume. It changed its size. So volume 
capital T, only can be controlled or kept the same if you have a non-flexible container, glass or metal or something else that's non-flexible. All right, there's a read this. I hope you read it. It says pressure is caused by molecules hitting the sides of a container or other objects. How often they hit and how hard they hit is pressure. Okay. And then it goes on to explain that a non-flexible container is needed if you want to have a, an internal pressure different from the external pressure. Okay, so in a balloon, if I breathe into a balloon and put more particles, I create a high internal pressure, but then the balloon expands and it gets bigger until that internal pressure is the same as the external pressure. It equalizes. So a flexible container will always equalize pressures. And it mentions that here. So going on to number six. Name two factors related to molecular movement that influence the pressure of a gas. All right, let's think about that in, in context of what it said in the read this section. Pressure is caused by molecules hitting the sides of a container or other objects. How often or how hard they hit. Well, we read earlier that the arrows, remember the arrows, if you go look at that, that, those flasks, the size of the arrows, the length of the arrows was the average kinetic energy. More energy is more speed here. It's going to hit harder. So one of the things that must increase in order for them to, to go hit more is going to have, be a longer arrow. The faster they're moving around, the more they're hitting, etc. So I'm going to say that the temperature, we, we said those lengths of those arrows is related to temperature. I'm going to say temperature is one of the factors that helps the molecules move and influences pressure. Okay. And then we can go back up here. We're talking about pressure. The other one has to be, the other thing that we, we measured was number of moles. Okay. So the more molecules that are in there, the more they're going to hit the sides, the more physical contact you will have with the side. So we said pressure is hitting the side of the container. Well, if I put more molecules in there, they will hit the container sides more often. So you either have to heat up the molecules to make them hit more often or hit harder. I guess temperature has, a, has an effect on how hard they hit and how frequently they hit. Or I can put more molecules in. Putting more molecules means they will hit more often. It doesn't mean they'll hit harder. Okay, that's strictly a function of their speed. But more of them means there will be more collisions. And pressure is about collisions. Okay, going on to number seven. Provide a molecular level explanation for the increase in pressure observed among the flasks in experiment A. So in experiment A, here is the flask, and you had all these molecules bouncing around. That's like A1. And then experiment A3 had a bunch of molecules. I'm not drawing as many as they had, but let's just assume. And so going from A1 to A3, we did not get an increase. So the two factors, again, the two factors we care about are right here, temperature and number of moles. And going from A1 to A3, we did not change the temperature. We did not make the arrows bigger. We did not make them go faster. So the pressure did not increase because they were moving faster. What did happen in experiment a is that there were just more molecules and so the chance the frequency with which they collide with the sides is going to go up because there's more of them it's like putting more gum or balls in a bingo machine if anybody plays bingo so let's make that into a sentence provide a molecular level explanation if there are more gas molecules, they will collide with the container. Container. More frequently. There's a good sentence, good science sentence there. Again, all, all that we did was add more particles, make them hit more often. And, and pressure, as, we, as we're going to define pressure, is about, how, is about collisions. 
more and harder collisions cause more pressure. Okay, eight. Same exact thing. Provide a molecular level explanation for the increase in pressure observed among the flasks in B. Well, if you look at the flasks in B going from left to right, you are not getting more molecules, which means that the frequency of the collisions didn't go up because, because of the number of particles. This is not a moles relationship. However, what you do get is faster molecules. You get molecules with longer arrows. Those arrows represent the energy of the molecules. Kinetic energy, meaning the speed energy. The, the kinetic is the energy of motion. So because they are moving faster, they hit harder. And because they're moving faster, they're also going to bounce around more. So you can imagine a slow molecule. It slowly goes across, hits the wall, bounces, slowly goes across, hits the wall. It's not going to hit walls as, as frequently as a molecule that's moving fast and pinging around really quickly. So we will say... Provide a molecular level explanation for the increase uh, if molecules move faster they will hit harder and more frequently. Double whammy. So, we, and again, pressure is about how many collisions and how hard the collisions are. So, heating something definitely increases the pressure if it's a gas. And down to number nine. We'll predict. All right, hypothesis time. Predict what would happen to the volume and internal pressure if a flexible container were used. All right, maybe I can draw this one. Only experiment A. So I have experiment A. Here's what's happening. I've got molecules here in a flexible container bouncing around. Keep in mind that that's not the only pressure on this system because outside of the container are molecules as well. And they don't all for you know, go in, but uh, here they, here we go. So there's a pressure pushing out from inside, from the molecules inside, and there's a pressure on the outside pushing back. These guys don't change, or at least they don't change very frequently. I mean, air pressure does change day to day, but it, uh, usually it's it's much slower changes than than like if I'm forcing air into a balloon. That's a much relatively quicker change. So the outside pressure is is what we're going to say constant for the purposes of this. All right, so these those arrows that I circle on the outside, don't, they don't change. But the inside pressure, so here's what we did. We're going to make take that same balloon, this flexible container, and instead of three guys in here, like I had, I'm going to add more guys. I'm going to blow more air into that balloon, and look at the density of that pressure now, pushing out. Okay, what I'm not changing, what I can't change, See how per unit area inside there are more arrows than outside? I forced more pressure into the balloon, by put, or more collisions on the inside than on the outside. Now if you're the balloon, if you're that el elastic sheath on the outside, if you feel more, more particles hitting you from the inside than are hitting from the outside, the inside wins. So the inside is going to expand. It's going to stretch because it's flexible and it can. Okay, so my balloon gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, those arrows on the inside spread out. Look at that. Now they're not so close together anymore because they've got more space. And at some point, they will be as spread out inside as the air outside is. And once they're even again, the balloon stops expanding. Because the pressures have equalized. So that's all air pressure is. We're trying to get the same amount of, uh, in, a, in a flexible container, I should say. In a balloon, you, you put extra pressure on the inside, it expands until the, the amount hitting the inside is the same as the amount hitting the outside. They're pushing with the same strength, you could, you could say. Okay, on number 10. So that, that's my prediction with the balloon. Uh, predict what would happen to the volume and internal pressure if a flexible con container were used in part B. 
Okay, so part B, again, here's our three gas particles inside compared to all the outside ones, which I won't draw. But now, with the balloon, I'm not, I'm not going to, or the flexible container, it could be other materials besides latex, uh, I'm not going to add more particles in, that was, that was experiment A, but what I am going to do in part B, we heated it, so I'm going to heat this flexible container. So what happens is now I have the intermediate here, the same size, is big arrows, big arrows. I gotta draw them all the way across. So now the arrows are really long. But again, just like before, I'm not changing the outside arrows. So now the arrows are as close together as they used to be, but they're much longer for the ones inside the balloon. So they hit harder and more frequently. The outside is still hitting the same. So this will cause an expansion as well. Okay, I'll, st I'll have the big arrows here. The balloon will now be bigger, but the outside will now balance out because with that increased volume, you've lowered the pressure. So going from here to here is, is going to relieve some of that extra pressure that was caused by the increase in the size of the arrows. So at the end, this outside pressure, P external, will be exactly the same as the P internal of the same same pressure. Now, number 11. Looks like another table. Let's make another table here. And this is a 3 by 3 here. So we got A and B. Direct slash inverse and then Equation. I'm going to do equation here. I know this is algebraic expression. That's the same as an equation. So for each experiment, determine the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables. Write an algebraic expression for the relationship. Okay. To preface this, here is a direct relationship. A direct relationship between two variables, let's call them x and y, is an x proportional to y, and usually there's a constant there, so k is a constant. So we would say as x gets bigger, y gets bigger. They are directly proportional. You can also see this written as x over y equals k. That just means I divided by y on both sides. So those are both ways to write a direct proportionality. An indirect proportionality, or an inverse proportion, rather, inverse proportionality is that x is proportional to k over y. In other words, as x goes up, 1 over y goes up, or the inverse of y goes up, which is the same as saying x times y equals k. That is an indirect, or sorry, I keep saying indirect, the inverse proportionality. Okay, so let's look at these. Experiment A. Experiment A, we added moles of gas. Moles of gas was the independent variable. We check up here. Where is it? There we go. Here's it. Moles of gas was the independent. Internal pressure was the dependent. And we found that when you add moles of gas, the internal pressure goes up. Increasing N increases PI. So if I come down here, because they're increasing together, I would say they are a direct relationship. So when I do my equation, I'm going to replace them with N and P. That means that the pressure internal is proportional to some constant K times N. That is my algebraic expression. Now, if you, you can write it this way. You can also write it as an equal sign, if you like. Uh, let's erase that. So you could do that. That is okay. PI equals KN. All right. Experiment B. Come back up here to my other table. In experiment B, I was looking at temperature and pressure. And we found that when I heated experiment B, you heated the flasks in experiment B, the pressure went up. So those are also going to be directly proportional. 
So both of these are direct proportionalities. Both of them are going to have a similar type of expression. So when the when I when the pressure internal varied directly with the temperature or pressure is equal to kT. K just means some number that makes the math work. Some factor. All right. That should be 1 through 11. Looks like our next stopping point is going to be at number 17. So you are going to now complete 12 through 16 and come to a stop. And then come back to this video. Okay, you should have completed 12 through 16. If not, go back and do that now. So let's look at 12. We have a brand new set of experiments here, three of them this time. It says, consider these uh, in model two. Name two materials that the containers could be made from to ensure that they are flexible. All right, there are a ton here. This is 12A. Uh, latex balloons are very common. It's a which is another form of just rubber. Rubber is a, uh, a flexible material. You could have nitrile. Nitrile, if anybody works in the medical industry, are gloves that are flexible. Like They look like latex gloves, but some people are allergic to latex, so they use nitrile as, a, as, a, as a, uh, another type of material. Oh, gosh. That's the most common things I can think of. Of course, I'm thinking of balloons. There's, there's, you could do it out of like gum if you wanted to. <laughs> sure. Uh, any, any flexible material that stretches would work here. Be creative. All right. What is always true for the external and internal pressure in a flexible container? Well, if you look at all of those experiments, the external and internal were equal. So pressure internal was equal to pressure external. Right. 13. Ah, oh, another table. I love these. Here we go. That, like that. Like this. Okay. So we have C, D, and E. And we're doing the independent, dependent, and controlled. So let's look at C. C, we have adding more gas. So right away I'm going to say my independent variable is number of moles. Because I'm adding more particles each time. Looks like the volume is something that I would be measuring because the volume is changing. So if I add, I can make that my dependent variable, which means pressure, both internal and external, is being controlled, and it is, you can see that. And temperature is also being controlled because that has not changed. Okay, uh, experiment D, it says heating the gas is what's being done, so I'm altering the temperature. That is my independent variable. Then I'm looking to see what changes. Looks like the uh, volume is changing, so I'm checking volume there. Looks like the pressure does not change. And if you count up the particles, it looks like there are the same number of moles of gas in each situation. And lastly, it says reducing external pressure. So I am altering the pressure external in this case and I'm looking to see what's changing it looks like the only thing that's changing here is volume and then everything else I can see temperature uh, is staying the same you can argue here so this is a tricky situation I am definitely changing the external pressure. So perhaps I'm in a room where I can adjust the room's pressure, or I'm in a vacuum chamber or something, or I put the balloon inside a bell jar and suck the air out of the bell jar. There's a lot of ways you can, you can change external pressure. But I'm gonna make the claim that the pressure internal is being controlled. And what's controlling the internal pressure is the fact that we have a flexible container. When you have a flexible container, your internal pressure is going to stay the same as your external pressure. So I am I am altering the external pressure myself, but because I'm doing that, I'm also kind of setting the internal pressure. And so we'll say the internal pressure is controlled. Now, the trickiness is that if you look at the internal pressure, it does not stay the same through all three experiments, but it is considered a control in this case. Okay.
So that's my chart there. Let's go to 14. 14 and 14 says provide a molecular level explanation for the increase in volume in experiment C. In experiment C, we added more moles of gas. So I did this. I took that balloon. Gosh, the tail of that balloon is almost as big as the balloon itself. There. Okay, I took the balloon, crammed it full of molecules. There they go. I'm not going to draw the arrows. I just put more in. What happened to the balloon? It got bigger so the molecules could spread out. Molecular level explanation, here's what's happening. More particles uh, create more pressure. We saw this in the first experiment. Now the trouble is, and I should say more pressures on the inside, the trouble is in this situation you now have an internal pressure greater than an external pressure. And that's not stable in a flexible container because the container can just move. So uh, you could picture tug of war, two people pulling on a rope and one of them pulls harder, the rope moves, it changes its position. Uh, in this case, a flexible container can change its position. So when I do more, more pressure on the inside of a flexible container, the container expands to equalize the internal and external pressures. It expands outward because the inside is pushing harder than the outside. Okay. In a non-flexible container, you can put a lot of extra pressure on the inside, even if there's less pressure on the outside, and who cares? The container itself is strong enough to resist the change in shape. But a latex balloon can't do that. It's not rigid enough to resist changes in shape. Provide molecular level, okay, so 15. Molecular level explanation for an increase in volume in D. All right, let's look at D. What do we do, D? D, we added temperature, okay. So, Faster particles in D create more pressure, don't they? Create more internal pressure. But the outside pressure is exactly the same. I make Heating the inner molecules does not mean that the outside particles are going to have any effect. So with the inside pressure being bigger than the outside pressure, the, the container expands to equalize pressures. Come on, there we go. The container expands again because the inside is pushing harder than the outside. All right, and I think we can see where 16 is going. Another molecular level explanation for why E balloons get bigger. Now, the interesting thing about part E is I did nothing to the molecules inside the balloon. There are the same molecules inside the balloon moving at the same speeds for all three parts of, of experiment E. So that didn't change. What I did do is I made the molecules on the outside of the balloon uh, less pressurized. So there, the, essentially what I did is I, I changed the outer conditions. And so now it's the same concept where the outside pressure is lower than the inside pressure, and so the inside pressure wins. So the outside pressure, outside the balloon anyway, is lowered. So the same thing as always, the balloon expands to equalize pressures. All the kinds of things we expect with flexible containers. Okay. All right, you're almost done. We're over halfway anyway. So now, 
you're going to go from the next part is 17 all the way up to 21 is right before the next stop sign. So you're going to complete 17 through 21, then come right back here and watch to see if you got it right. Okay, so you should have completed 17 through 21. If not, please go back and attempt that. So let's start with this. Compare experiment A of model 1 with experiment C of model 2. How are these experiments similar and how are they different in terms of variables? So let's go look. Experiment C, N, V, P, T. So we, we changed the, the number of moles. We measured the change in volume and pressure and temperature were constant. And then up here, NPVT. So we changed the number of moles and we checked to see if the pressure was constant, or if the pressure changed and the volume and the temperature kept constant. So, uh, scroll, 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 scroll. So, model one, A kept the volume constant. C kept, I think the temperature, right? Oh gosh, I've already forgotten. I'm like a goldfish. No. Did I get that wrong? Pressure and temperature constant. Kept the temperature constant. Pressure. Pressure is the difference, yeah. C kept the pressure constant. So having a non-flexible container is how you control your volume, is how you keep volume constant. Having a flexible container is how you keep your pressure constant. Make sure I can do that. What do they do the same? Both altered, had the independent variable as the, the moles. Moles of gas. So both of them were changing the moles of gas, but one of them was keeping the volume constant and one of them was keeping the pressure constant. All right, in terms of variables. I guess both of them also kept the temperature constant. Let me see. Yes, both of them also kept the temperature constant. Let me write that in. Kept altered moles. Uh, that's fine. 18. Compare B with D. How are they similar and different? Okay, so B and D both change temperature. Both altered temperature. But you could say the same thing uh, in terms of, of differences, that, that B kept the volume constant. B kept volume, I'll just put V for volume, constant, and D kept pressure constant. Because again, just like A and C, B and, and D are in a, a non-flexible and a flexible container respectively, so B is always going to have a constant volume and D is always going to have a constant pressure. Okay, 19. If experiment E of model 2 were done in a non-flexible container, would there be any change to the internal pressure of the flask when the external pressure is reduced? So here we are. Let's, let's pretend that this is now experiment E with four particles of gas at some... like this. Okay, there we go. Uh, and all we do is we reduce the external pressure. So if this was the original external pressure and I go back and I remove some external pressure, all right, what's gonna happen to the inside? Well, this is a non-flexible container. It can't expand, so it can't change the volume. Uh, and as long as it's sealed, particles can't get out. I can't remove particles. I can't change the speeds. There's no heat involved. So there would be no change. I'm not affecting anything inside of this container. So I can't affect the internal pressure by changing the external pressure. That's the thing with non-flexible containers. So no change. 
new change. So let's keep going here. 20. Ah, another table. For each experiment, to determine the relationship between the independent and dependent. Okay, so another independent dependent thing. So here are our choices. Yeah, four of them. Okay, one, two, three, four. So it's C, D, and E. We have dependent or independent, and then we have the equation. So experiment C. Experiment C added more moles of gas as the independent variable. So this is moles, and we were looking to see if the volume changed. Moles for volume. More moles of gas, the bigger the volume. As we, as we added more particles, it got bigger. So this is a direct relationship. Both of them increased. More moles, more volume. When we go to D, heating the gas. Heating the gas, more moles, sorry, more temperature. We look, the arrows got longer, the volume got bigger. More temperature, more volume. Okay, that's bigger. And the E was reducing the pressure. So we took out the external pressure, the volume got bigger. This is the only one I've, we've seen so far where you put less pressure on the outside, but you got more volume. This is an inverse relationship. Okay, so let's make those into equations. I may have to do them down here to get more room. So for part C, direct relationship between moles and volume. So N equals KV. For part D, more temperature was more volume. So temperature equals K times V. And lastly, pressure and volume. Well, that's an inverse relationship. So pressure equals K over V. Or if you want to rewrite that so there's nothing in the denominator, you could do pressure times volume equals K. All right, good stuff. That is 20. Let's do 21. Twenty-one. Okay, we got three pictures. The three samples of identical gas molecules below have the same internal pressure. Rank the samples from lowest temperature to highest temperature and add arrows. Okay. Oh, come on. All right, so we have this one. Same size, big size. I have four particles here. I have eight particles here, and I have four particles here. Okay, let's think about this. Be, so that I can refer to them easily, I'm going to call this situation A, situation B, and situation C. So looking at situation A and C, they both have the same amount of particles, or moles of gas. C, however, is a much bigger balloon. Okay, and I believe they said, we're, I, they don't say it, but we have to assume that these are flexible containers, otherwise this, we can't make comparisons between the insides. So in order to compare them, they have to be flexible. So that's the assumption I'm going to make. So if, if you had two balloons, A and C, and they, you put the same amount of particles in both, one balloon gets bigger, well, it's not, the only thing that makes things bigger is pressure. Well, it's not because there's more particles. More particles would make more pressure on the inside and make C bigger, but that's not what's happened here. So the only way that C can be bigger than A is if it has more temperature. They have to hit harder and more frequently. So these have to be big arrows. Okay. And these have to be not, these have to be kind of medium arrows, I think, because otherwise A would be just the same size if they had the same sized arrows. So A's arrows have to be smaller and C's arrows. All right, let's look at A and B. A and B have the same volume, the same size. They take the same amount of space, but B has more particles than A. If B has more particles than A, then B's arrows have to be smaller than A's arrows, because if B's arrows were the same size and there's more particles, B is going to have more pressure. 
So to have less pressure, it's got a little tiny arrows that I probably can't even draw with my stylus here, so I'm gonna just not draw the length of the arrows and just say they're little arrows on each dot. Little tiny ones. Okay. And that's the only way that this works. So C has to have the longest arrows, B has to have the shortest arrows. Now it says rank the samples from lowest to highest temperature. High, long arrows is high temperature. So temperature of C is going to be the biggest one. Okay? Which will be greater than the temperature of A, who's the next longest, which will be greater than the temperature of B. B, cold, B is the cold balloon, C is the hot balloon, A is the medium temperature balloon. All right. So you've almost reached the end. The rest is the extension. And there are three more questions to go, 22, 23, 24. So pause this, go attempt those questions, and then come right back here. All right, you should have finished the entire podial. So we're going to go over the last couple here. Uh, 22, draw a sample of gas that is colder than all of the samples in 21. Explain why you are sure that it is colder. Okay. Uh, the easiest way for me to do this, I'll try to draw on the same page. I'm going to draw it the same size as part B, and I'm just going to draw it with more molecules than part B. Because if I have even more than part B and have the same size, then they have to be going even slower than part B. So they have to be colder. All right, that's mine. Uh, you could try and do this a different way. I suppose you could draw one as large as part C, but with fewer molecules, like one molecule in there, because it would have to be... No, no, that would be even hotter. Excuse me. I guess you could make C the same, but you'd have to put a ton of molecules in there. All right. Anyway, part B is the most obvious way to do it. Or sorry, the way I've done it, I think, is the most obvious way to do it. But there are other ways to do this. Let's go to 23. Four of the relationships you investigated are named after scientists who discovered the relationships and use the internet, so this is some research. Okay. So we identified four things. We identified uh, the relationship between uh, number of moles and pressure, number of moles was equal to K times the pressure, okay? We identified that the, pr the pressure was related to K times the temperature. I believe we saw that, right? Yeah. And then we identified that the pressure times the volume was equal to a K. And then we identified that the volume was related to K times the number of moles. And we revealed that the volume was related to K times the temperature. I didn't do these in order. <laughs> I'm just doing them off the top of my head. Those are the five relationships we saw. And it says that there are four scientists who did a lot of research. So I'm, I guess four of these relationships we're going to be able to associate with a scientist who did that research. So I'm going to put in the ones I know. Robert Boyle did this one. Hey there, stylus. Why don't we do some writing? So this is often called Boyle's Law. Okay, because he was dealing with the uh, pressure and volume of a gas. All right, Jacques Charles, a French chemist or physicist, depending on what you think, Charles did this one. So this is often called Charles's Law, where he was, was dealing with the temperature and volume of gases in a flexible container. All right. Oh, they didn't add a fifth scientist in there. I'm going to give it to you. But I'll do the others first. The one who did moles, who's very famous for moles, was Avogadro, Amadeo Avogadro. So this is Avogadro's Law. They did not list the one who did pressure and temperature, but his name is Joseph-Louis Gay-Lussac. L-O-U-L-U. I'm going to misspell his name. 
I know it ends in AC. It might just be LU. Look that up. <laughs> Which must mean the last one is Guillaume Amonton. With an S. A lot of French people. And some Italian. Avogadro was Italian. Boyle might have been English, I'm not sure. All right. Not that it matters, of course. 24. Ah, so they talk about the ideal gas law. Chemists combined all the relationships in these models that we just drew, so all of these can be combined into one large expression. Notice they all have K in it. Well, I wrote it as K, but the 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 chemistry community, I guess, if the believes the international chemistry community, instead of K, they use R. They say R is the constant. It doesn't matter, it's a letter. It just represents a number that never changes. And so um, if you look, so let's say, look at all of these values. Uh, let's start with, we'll start with pressure. Pressure, and there's an equal sign here somewhere in the middle, okay? Pressure was directly proportional to temperature. So I can put temperature on the other side. Okay, pressure was inversely proportional to volume, so I can put volume on this side. Okay, moles was directly relational to pressure, so I can put moles on the other side. Volume and moles are directly proportional, so they should be on opposite sides. And volume and temperature should be directly proportional, they should be on opposite sides, so they are. So that puts all of my stuff in the right place. We just need a number. Now, it turns out with constants. I know up here K is sometimes on other sides, whatever. But in actual reality, it does not matter which side you put a constant on. A number that never changes. Variables, you have to put them on the correct side of an equation. Constants, you don't. I mean, if you... Uh, we will learn later that when I put R on this side, it represents a certain number. If I put R over on the other side where, where pressure is, it would be a different number. But being on that side, we would, would, we would always keep that number. So uh, it would just be 1 over r. It's, so don't worry too much about that. Um, we're going to put r over here. Be, and, and when we put it over there, it has a certain value. And we'll just say uh, that's easier to remember. OK. So there you go. PV equals nRT. That is the ideal, let's write this down, the ideal gas law, which is just a combination of all the individual relationships that we saw up here from all of these wonderful dead scientists. There you have it. That's your gas law variable, Pogel. Good luck.